Is India on track to play catch up with China? Over the past two decades, the country's economy has grown at a rapid pace, overtaking the UK, France, Italy and Brazil in size. Now, as hundreds of millions of Indians begin voting in elections, some economists are speculating about the country's potential to rival even China in the not-too-distant future. To talk more about this, I'm joined now by Alicia Garcia-Herrero, Chief Economist for Asia-Pacific at Natixis. Alicia, India's growth story over the past few decades has been really remarkable. Help us understand, first of all, the conditions that allowed it to take place. Well, thanks for the invite, thanks for the question. It actually is uh, harder than it looks uh, by just focusing on the last few years where indeed, as you rightly point out, India has really surprised everybody on a positive side. But to be very frank, if we go just a little bit further um, with the benefit of hindsight to the 1950s, just to say India was as large as China and then it lost it. it and, in many occasions, first too much planning, even compared to China. That's, you know, the history of China's 80s, where uh, India's 80s, where everything was planned, lots of industrial uh, planning, and it didn't work out too costly, too many subsidies. Then 1991, big crisis, because uh, basically this is something that would never have happened to China because the capital account was fully closed. India opened and it ended, ended up in a crisis. So it's only recently, that's the point I'm trying to make, that that in a way India has started to catch up with China. So we'll need a few years. Uh, my estimates are uh, 250 uh, to get to a similar GDP, but it's not obviously guaranteed. India has to keep on doing what uh, China did uh, when it grew very fast opening up, lowering import tariffs, uh, attracting more for, uh, foreign investment, especially manufacturing, and basically reforming the country as fast as possible. All of that is needed to achieve that goal. If that's a goal, I'm, I'm not sure. So in many ways, it has been a, a real success story, but we should say that this growth has not benefited everyone equally. When it comes to GDP per person, India ranks really poorly, 147th in the world, in fact. Talk to me about the contrast between India as a $4 trillion stock market power on the one hand, and on the other as a place where tens of millions of people can't afford basic health care. Well, it's a very good point. And again, we can't forget that... Um, in a way, it's, it's not too different from China, except for the fact that China did manage to get about 400 million people out of poverty. In other words, it did lift the, the lowest end. But the income inequality remained uh, uh, very strong in China because, and this is very similar to India, that's the similar part, because of regional disparities. So in India, it's obviously north-south, with the North being um, in, in, a, in a much worse situation. And uh, in China, it's basically the coastal areas versus the West. So, you know, the, the, this, these regional disparities um, create um, the need for industrial policy. And, and China has tried to move West, as we all know. And I think India will need to start moving North um, as soon as possible. Is this primarily a rural-urban divide, or is this really a, a stark regional difference we're talking about here? Well, Delhi is a huge city in the north, so it's not only a urban divide. I mean, there is that, absolutely, but actually the uh, rural-urban divide, I think that um, uh, income disparity is going to shrink. And the main reason is that uh, India is on the cusp of a very rapid urbanization because it's led by the means at the current juncture to build the necessary infrastructure. So it's, it's, it has been delayed for many years. Uh, India's urbanization rate is, is barely 32%. 32%, uh, China is 62%, it's double. So you can tell that India really will urbanize now that the means are there, that the foreign capital is interested in this. So that, that income disparity between urban and rural will, it may remain, but more population will be in the rich areas. Um, that has already happened in China. We still have a lot of income disparities. So it's more about regional and another very important point, um, which I hope India can avoid, um, 
across generations, so basically elderly, um, um, you know, being left behind. That could be India's case. In the case of China, ironically, it's the youth. It's the youth that can't really follow their, you know, parents or even grandparents. So, so you know, intergenerational income disparities are also very important. So basically, regional and intergenerational are the key income disparities India needs to avoid. And that's a really uh, interesting point you made as well about the demographic difference between the two countries. I want to talk to you a little bit about foreign investment as well, because that's played a really big part in India's development story. We saw a huge amount of money flowing in, especially in the first decade of this century. But over the past few years, it's been a bit more of a mixed picture, both in terms of absolute value and FDI as a share of GDP. Why, when India has so many other things going for it, is it underperforming on this metric? It's a great question. So we, we just had some comments from Apple um, on exactly why they're being so slow in, in, in reshuffling part of their supply chain towards India. And the answer is simple. Import tariffs. It just costs too much to import the necessary goods, in, intermediate goods that India can, cannot yet produce. So, you know, they really need to slash these tariffs so that manufacturing companies find it cheap to produce in India. It's not about the labor cost only, it's about the import, imported goods that need to be comp competitive. And, and I think that's one reason why manufacturing FDI, as you rightly point out, has not really performed as expected. The inflows into India are mostly into infra, mostly institutional funds. So portfolio flows more than FDI at the current juncture. If we look at the latest IMF projections, we can see a divergence in the pace of growth between China and India. Why does that contrast matter? Uh, well, first of all, it seems like everybody's now, you know, pushing for India against China. This is not the story. The story is the different structural, the, the different uh, moment in, in, in the structural change of the two economies. So, China is basically a $13,000 economy per capita, and India is not even a fourth of that. So, so India has those low-hanging fruits that China doesn't have anymore, and that's why India is growing faster. Now, that's not enough because the low-hanging fruits at some point will end. Which are they? Population, as you mentioned, the, the population um, uh, boost because. Uh, uh, for, um, fertility rate is still high, certainly compared to China, but also urbanization, as I mentioned. Th these are the two main issues, but that can't be enough. Uh, India needs to create this uh, strong um, single market where people really want to produce because first it's easy to import and, and the market is well integrated, let alone possibility to export to the rest of the world. That is not yet there. And that's why, yeah, the divergence is there, but the point is for how long? So you, you need to keep India going through reforms, not only through low hanging fruits. This story is also really interesting from a geopolitical perspective. We talk a lot about the consequences of having a more powerful China on the world stage, but India too is gaining in might. The two powers are, of course, vital members of BRICS, a coalition of countries that includes Brazil, Russia and South Africa. And as of this year, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran and the UAE as well. What role does India play in this alliance and what significance would its growing economic might have in its influence in global affairs more generally? Great question and complex question. I think India for a long time, especially since the second mandate, Modi's mandate, claims um, to be really the the leader, if I may say so, or, or the uh, the lighthouse. That's the expression that the, the Resina Forum used uh, a year ago when they, they introduced this idea of India leading the global south. And the main reason why the, India has a point in this is that India is more, really in terms of income per capita, much more of the global south than China already is, which is a middle income economy. So India is trying very hard to, to, to attract the minds of all of these frontier markets uh, to realize that they could be India. Maybe being China is just too diffi difficult. They don't have the savings. 
they don't have the industrial capacity yet. So India could be much more of a model, and India is really playing that card. If I may, just to conclude on, on the BRICS, um, because of India being the one and only country in the world with a similar population, and as I said, with at least an expectation of one day becoming as large as China, even if it's this is three decades to go, slightly less in the best circumstances, um, its role in the BRICS is complicated. Uh, just bear in mind that India was uh, not very keen on, on expansion of BRICS because that dilutes India, it doesn't dilute China, because China basically chooses whom to, to, to bring over, but it does dilute India. And the best example, uh, the proof of the pudding, although there could be many, but is who is now heading the new development bank, which is uh, the BRICS development bank. And now it's Brazil, yeah, it's Dilma, it's not, used to be uh, India. And India has the very same capital as China in that bank. But, you know, because of the power balance, uh, China by now is leading this group. And I think for India, this is very difficult. And I could argue that in 10 years, in 10 years, maybe India won't be there. We don't really know. This will be such a fascinating relationship to watch develop. And um, finally, Alicia, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is expected to win another term. What do you think we can expect from him on an economic front? Well, Modi has done quite well on a number of issues. Um, first of all, quite frankly, putting India in, in the spotlight, G20, the US being very keen to collaborate with India. All of this is geopolitics, but you know, it, it, it requires some leadership to, to get there. Uh, on the economy, and notwithstanding uh, India's growth, um, India has not created enough employment compared to the promise. So it was about 50 million um, uh, em new employment uh, per year, 50 million. Um, and that's not yet there. So most of the gains have been quite, as you pointed out before, uh, quite dividing of the population south, um, the merchants, as they call them in India. I mean, it's not really about um, widespread um, increase in disposable income. So I think more jobs to, to end the story need to be created. For that, you need to open up the economy. You need more manufacturing investment. You really need to, to create uh, jobs from manufacturing. It cannot only be the service sector uh, for an economy like India, because they need to import, and that will create a lot of imbalances in terms of trade deficits. So India needs to produce and it has the population ready to produce. So, so that's the next step for Modi or so I hope.